Can everyone see it? Okay. So, hello. Today I'll be talking about odometry wheel and servo clamp. My name is Austin Liu. I'm a sophomore at Lebanon Trail High School. I've done three years of junior FLL, three years of FLL, and this is my fourth year in FTC. Uh, I'm the builder, team captain, and driver for my robotics team. And in my free time, I like to play some play tennis, video games, and guitar. So on today's agenda, I'll be talking about the odometry wheel, what it is, the holder design I have, and how I pick the wheels and the encoders. For the servo clamp, I'll be talking about why we need a servo clamp in FTC, and the three different types of ways you can mount uh, something onto your servo. So there's a direct servo mount, a servo block mount, and a servo shaft mount. <clears throat> so odometry wheel. So odometry wheels are dead wheels, basically, on the robot that help measure the distance during autonomous. These um, omni wheels here, they spin without motor, so they're passive and they freely spin. And we use omni wheels because omni wheels can go in any direction. So when you have a mechanism chassis and you're strafing, then the uh, omni wheels will be there. And you, know, you see a spring here that's pulling it down. So this makes sure that the omni wheels are always in contact with the ground. So you don't skip anything. So why would you use odometry wheels? In FTC, most teams have a mechanism wheel chassis and this is when they use odometry wheels. The motor encoder for the mechanism wheels are not really accurate because mechanism wheels skid a lot and they shift around the shaft by going like up and down. And usually on an FTC robot, you will have three omni wheels at three different positions. So you will have two in the Y direction here. So one on top, one on bottom. Uh, left and right side of the chassis, they work together to have accurate heading info. So if you go forward and backward or you turn, you will use these two omni wheels. I mean, these two odometry wheels. And the one here on the X axis, this is for the horizontal movement. So if you're strafing, it will re give you a reading and values. So the first holder design that we had was uh, non-spring loaded. It's right here. It, it was like very tedious to adjust because it wasn't spring loaded and so it had to be very accurate. So to adjust little by little to achieve the desired accuracy. And because it was like very stiff, it was easily disrupted by external objects on the field. So for example, if um, on rover ruckus, there's a ball coming under your robot, it would disrupt the reading. And then the second holder design we had was called, uh, it's a non-bore through encoder. So we use Lego gears here, you can see, to relocate the encoder off the wheel axle because this is a dead end a dead end servo, I mean dead end encoder. So we have to use gears to relocate it. And we have a spring loaded here. So for the springs, you have to find a specific spring because some springs are too strong while others are too weak. You have to find the perfect one. And one tip is like when you lift up your robot off the ground, the wheels, the odometry wheels should move downward a teeny bit when the chassis is lifted. Our third design in the one we're currently testing is the bore through encoder. So this one was easy to mount and it's mounted onto the wheel shaft. So it's a shaft going through, has two points. Uh, yeah, this is the bore through encoder here. This is the first iteration I had and then the second iteration we had. 
and they're two different designs because initially this was a screw mount and then we switched it to a shaft mount but if i made this a shaft mount right here the wire would get in the way so i had to adjust this encoder by moving it downwards tilting it downwards a bit and extruding a piece out here for just for the shaft and then this is the final real design on the actual robot and there are two different ways to mount our holders so one's the screw mount right here you can see a screw one screw from here is sticking all the way through the dometry wheel holder into the channel uh, it's one point of contact. It's easy to mount, but it's very unstable. So it affects the accuracy of the readings. And the second one is the axle mount, where you have two points of contact here. It's the odometer wheel I just showed you guys. Two points of contact. You have one ball bearing here, one ball bearing here, and a collar here. And this one is harder to mount, but gives you it's more stable, so it gives you better readings and more accurate values. And so for dumpster wheels, you can use any type of omni wheels. So usually four inch mechanism wheels are the most common for FTC. So your dumpster wheels should be smaller than the drive wheels. Usually you can have two inches to two and a half inch wheels. And smaller wheels means better resolution, but you get larger reading values across the field. So first one right here is a Roboshop 60 millimeter Omni wheel. It has an adapter right here. Next one is a 58 millimeter Roboshop Omni wheel. You can use these inserts, and we use the middle one for the gears, the axle insert, and then finally have the rev Omni wheels. And these are the ones we're currently using. There's no adapter needed for this one. So encoder mount connection. So there are two physical mounts. Like I said before, there's a dead end and bore through. The S14 encoder is a dead end one and the rev one is a bore through. In the FTC control system, they don't really have uh, encoder ports specifically for odometry wheels. So you have to plug them into the motor encoder ports. And you have to remember if motor, encor motor encoder port zero correlates to what odometry wheel. So when you code and you refer to this odometry wheel, you're going to refer to motor port encoder port zero. Encoder selection. So the first one, we have an E4T encoder. This is the very first one we used. Um, here's some technical info. And one thing we found was it was hard to mount because we had to assemble it together and the center tool was really hard to use and fit everything in together. And this you know, comes with the Tetrix kit originally. The second coder is the S4T motor and coder. It's a little more expensive. It has three different shaft options for you. There's a eighth of an inch diameter, a six millimeter diameter, and a quarter inch diameter. We used the six millimeter diameter one. And the one thing we found was that it's very fragile. So our side plates were touching this and during the competitions, the side plates would get really tight and it would influence the readings, making it less accurate. And at the Trinity River qualifier of last or last season, the connector got really loose because it's a really small connector. I think it's like two pins. Yeah, so it's really small, so it got really loose, and we had to go and replace the wire because we couldn't find the problem uh, during the competition. And the last encoder is the Rev Borther encoder. It's the current one we're using. It's a magnetic encoder, and they give you four bore inserts. You have a half inch hex, three eighths of an inch hex, and a five millimeter hex, which is the one we're using. And then you also have a quarter inch round. This one, it's really easy to mount. It's a solid encoder, and it's very sensitive and has a high resolution. 
So performance comparisons, um, Rev born coders, it has around a thousand ticks per inch of movement, which means it has a higher resolution. It reads more ticks per inch, while the S4T only reads 196 ticks per inch. So this one, just it's just higher resolution. And from our, this, these results are from our 2019 summer study project. And um, so these results are from our 2019 summer study project where we compared our motor encoders to the dead wheels. And we did uh, different speeds and different loads. So as you can see at the three graphs on the bottom, blue is the motor encoder and red is the dead wheels, the red dots. And yeah, the dead wheels have a smaller standard deviation. It's usually or almost a uniform straight line as while the uh, motor encoders are like almost all over the place. And I haven't gotten a chance to test the current one I have used or worked on over summer but it's gonna be technically a 25 pound load robot because it has, it's an actual competition robot as these are just uh, bare chassis with weights put on them. And so for the servo clamp, so and typically in FTC, you usually have a servo clamp for several different reasons for uh, number one, like pulling a heavy load, you'll need a strong and stable servo clamp. For example, last season in Skystone, you had to pull around like 17, 18 stones at the high level. So you have to make sure they don't fall while also being able to pull it out at a good speed. These rolling goals and cascade effect or balls had to be stacked up, you had to move it around. And then there's also your hooking requirement like in Rover Ruckus, uh, robots had to hook onto this hook right here and had to lift their whole robot off the ground, which meant to, you have to have a very stable clamping mechanism. So the first type of mount is the direct servo mount. It's just directly onto the spline. This is usually used for light loads, like light objects, such as the capstone. Next one is a servo block mount. Um, the servo block here provides more torque because it isolates the lateral load off the spline right here and it puts it on the casing, uh, as you can see. And it's what we used for last season when we had to pull out the foundation. And then finally is a servo shaft clamp uh, mount. It's a servo that's mounted onto the channel with a spline to shaft converter here. And then you have a shaft here and you have a ball bearing here. So it's very stable as you have a ball bearing. And this is the one I've been testing over summer. And it works um, really well. Okay. Here I played the, I'll play the video again to show it. So I could pull the foundation. And yeah, we were working on this all summer. The credits, the custom clamp, we were having issues last season with our clamp being inconsistent. So we started to study Gwen Free's clamp because they're really good. And we tried to copy their idea and learn from them. And then for odometrials, uh, Anthony's data and code, I used it from the 2019 summer project and those are the results. And yeah, that's it for my presentation. Any questions? Okay, if nobody has any questions for Austin, we're going to move on to our next presentation from here. I have one quick question. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so uh, for the encoders for the uh, odometry wheels, 
um, you have to use the encoders, but you, the, it's compromising a motor port for each one of those, right? So yeah, in the motor encoder port. But like, but those typically the motor encoder goes with the motor port to that motor. But in this case, uh, those odometry wheels aren't run by motors, correct? Yeah. They're free. Yeah, they're freely spinning. Okay, so you basically you're going to have three motors that won't be able to function with encoders on them, right? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so start screen sharing. So um, next um, topic that I studied was uh, a differential source drive chassis. So um, first, um, a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Derek. Um, I'm currently a sophomore and I go to Jasper High School. Um, this is gonna be my 10th year in first in my fourth year in FTC. Um, I'm part of the hardware team and um, some things that I do is to play the cello, I like Pokemon, and play some other games. <laughs> so a basic rundown of um, the topics that I'm going to be covering in mean, this presentation is first, um, what exactly is differential swerve drive? Uh, like when compared to a regular swerve, how the build process was in building this chassis, um, programming the chassis, and then finally uh, we'll end it with a demo of the chassis. So first, um, go on to explain what exactly is a differential swerve drive. So usually um, in a regular swerve drive, um, you would have a motor driving the wheel and then you would either have a motor or a servo um, turning the orientation of the wheel um, using a differential swerve drive. Um, it looks somewhat like uh, the diagram or the picture of the CAD model you see below. Um, so there's, in differential swerve drive, there's a module. Um, each module is basically a wheel. So uh, each module is driven by two motors. Um, the differential swerve drives, um, it, the two gears are um, what are attached to each two motors. So technically each motor drives um, one gear. So if you see how this works, um, for example, one gear would drive the top, um, the other gear would drive the bottom, um, and then there's gonna be a, a involute gear, and the bevel gear in the middle that um, connects to the wheel, and that's how it spins. So how this works is that on the top and bottom, um, gears spin, this creates the turning of the middle gear, which is attached to the wheel. And in order for the, the module or the wheel to go um, in the same speed, but keep a certain direction, um, what would happen is that the motors would turn at the same speeds um, in opposite directions. If you can imagine it, uh, like if this turns clockwise, another way turns um, counterclockwise, you can uh, imagine that that's spinning. So, and the way how you can turn is that um, essentially one of the gears would turn slower or faster than the other. So, you know, what are the benefits and uh, what are some of the pros and cons when compared um, to a regular sort of drive? Why would you do this over a regular sort of drive? Um, first, um, each differential sort of drive module is extremely compact. Um, it saves a lot of space. Um, also, when compared to a regular serve, um, regular serve chassis would use a servo to rotate. Um, in a differential serve drive, you would use only the two motors to drive and the two motors to rotate. So um, you would you'll be using motors, which are stronger. Um, this also applies that you can 
um, apply full motor power in all directions. And this results in um, a really big increase in acceleration. So that's what makes it pretty fast. The cons though, this is not, um, this is not really that reliable. And if something were to break, it would take actually quite a while to fix it. Um, so, cause you have to get in there. There's lots of little things involved that make it all work together, but um, yeah. And this is also pretty complex. So it's not that easy to do. So uh, moving on to the build process. Um, so first, uh, in the in a swerve drive chassis, um, as you've seen in the previous picture, I would be building two modules, um, one on each side of the chassis. So, in general, for everything that I built, um, whatever I built for one side would be I would build another duplicate on the other side. Um, I would always uh, build one first and then see like um, what went wrong, and then the second time that I built it build the other side, it will always be much faster and more efficient. So um, I first started with building each individual source module. I started with one side. How this works is that um, it's just a top and bottom gear and then attached to a middle bevel gear. And then um, I used a 2.5 inch Colson wheels and um, I tapped a hole, threaded holes into the hex shaft. Um, this way I was able to um, screw in a pan head screw from the side that would keep the bevel gear in place and the hex shaft from falling out. Um, and the uh, wheel could rotate because there's individual uh, pulley bearings or V-groove bearings that run, around, run along the sides of the gears. So that's what enables um, the module itself to turn. So as I said before, um, I would always build one side first and then I would always go move on to the other side after I finished building one. So after finishing building the swerve module, um, it was time to go on to the gearbox. Um, this way that the motors can actually get the power to the module itself. Um, for the gearbox, um, each gearbox would have two motors. So each gearbox was assigned to essentially one each module. So there would be two motors driving. Um, and how this works is that there are going to be, there's two bevel gears um, driving uh, attached to the motor shaft. And then those two bevel gears would drive another um, bevel gear that will be dry, attached to another gear, which then um, that final gear would actually drive each individual um, gear on the swerve module. So it looks kind of com complicated at first, but um, essentially it, it's just um, duplicated on each side. It's just that one side's flipped so that it can each drive. One drives the top and one drives the bottom gears. Um, some of the things I had to do um, to compensate for this is that um, one of the things I ha actually had to do was cut the motor shaft um, because if I inserted in the motor, um, the motor shaft would actually be too long. It would be hitting um, this bevel gear. So I had to cut all of those in half. And another thing I had to do was for these M3 um, screws, um, I couldn't find a short enough screw. So I actually bought the shortest screw and then I cut the shortest screw with the screw cutter. So it became pretty short, but um, those were just some of the little things that I went through while building it. And next, um, this part is just a dead wheel. So you can see that it looks like an odometry wheel, but um, I just decided to use um, how an odometry wheel case um, with uh, 58 um, odometry wheels that we used on our own robot. Um, so what these dead wheels were for, were for is that um, my robot would have two modules. So if you can imagine it, there would just be one module on the right, one module on the left, but there would be nothing to really um, support the chassis. So um, I would make a dead wheel, make four dead wheels, one on each corner of the chassis, this way that the, the chassis actually has something to support and run on. 
so it doesn't just like lean or tip over that easily. Um, what I did was that I just took um, a CAD model of our odometry wheels and then I just edited it so that it could fit my needs. Um, since um, in our odometry wheel CAD, uh, we had like extra space for a gear and uh, extra holes for a screw. I didn't really need it, so um, I just changed and extruded some parts of the CAD model. And I think, and how I would mount this um, is that I would drill holes onto, I drilled holes onto um, the side of the, of the case and then I would just um, put a screw in and then attach a nut to the other side. So yeah, so um, moving on, you can see how I did it. Um, I just, for each, each of the sides, I would have essentially a side plate connected with a pattern plate with um, a, a dead wheel in the middle. So yeah, it would be four dead wheels in each corner. I would just drill holes and then attach it to the pattern plate. After I did this on all four sides, um, basically I have the basic outline of the chassis done. Next, I would just have to mount some mount the swerve draw, swerve modules and my motors in the middle. So to do this, um, this gives a better visualization of how it really looks like. So uh, essentially, um, everything is just um, duplicated. So one is just mirrored on each side. So um, for once, this is how the swerve module would actually um, itself be um, attached to the middle section. So um, the swerve module is actually um, not screwed into anything um, because the module needs to rotate. So there's going to be, there are four, um, there's actually eight in total, but there's four on the top and so there's four on the bottom, so there's going to be eight per module. There's going to be eight um, B group bearings. Um, they're going to be running along, there's a little bit of a, uh, a I guess you call it a rail or a track for the uh, V grooves to run on along the swerve module itself. Um, and this is what keeps it in place um, from moving too much. Um, essentially, this would be the same as on the other side. And then I would have, this is the gearbox um, that I built earlier, and then I will just um, have a gearbox on one side of the module, and then I will have another little mounting um, bracket on the other side, which would keep the module supported. And this is how it turned, this is how it would look like. Um, I would just have um, casings around it to make sure to keep everything in place. And yeah, this is how um, it turned out. So I would attach side plates um, to each side of the module, I guess you could call it that. And then um, how I put it all together was just through two go build the rails. Um, yeah. And if you look pretty closely, you can see that these go build the world rails weren't really long enough. They weren't the exact length um, to go across my chassis. So I just added a, a little bit of of a standoffs there um, so that it could extend it. But yeah, this is was the basic layout. Um, at this point, my chassis was um, pretty much complete. And then um, I can move on to actually testing to see um, if my motors could actually spin the module. So now how I would test this is through the ref interface software. Um, when I test it, it will look something like this picture on the left. I um, actually just took a screenshot of what it looked like. Um, so I would have four motors, and then you can see that there's going to be a, a blue slider. Um, this essentially just, um, you can slide it in one direction, and it, um, it would make the motor turn at a certain speed. Um, in this white little blank box, it's like a set. You basically just set the motor speed up to a specific speed that you want it to go. Um, I just did this for each individual motor and each individual module um, to test to see if it works. So, yeah. And this is a video of me testing it. So I would elevate the robot first on some magazine so that it just wouldn't run on the ground and go everywhere. So right now I'm just spinning one module. That was a little bit fast, but. So 
So right now I'm spinning one motor of one module. So right now this module is turning in only one direction. Um, so yeah, so right now you can see that the module has stopped rotating, but the wheel is still spinning. It might be a little bit hard to see. Oh God. But essentially what I did was that um, I made each motor run um, at the same speed, but in, in turning in the opposite direction. So um, this caused the module's orientation to not change, but the wheel was still spinning. So after the, I, after I did it for one module, uh, I just do the same for the other side. I would always just test one motor and then I would uh, uh, run the other motor at the same time so that the, mo the wheel was spinning but the orientation wasn't changing. Now, after I finished doing that, I would, I would actually make the motor spin in uh, the other, one of the motors would spin in the other direction. So this way that, as you can see, the left module is actually turning really, really fast. So if I spin them in the negative power, then you know, or essentially the gears would be spinning in the same direction, the module would turn. This is how I just tested to make sure all my motors were working and to see if I need to make any changes um, before I went on to programming. So talking about programming, um, how this was programmed is that um, I, the left joystick was driving in the arcade style um, and then the right joystick would be for tank turning. So, and of course the left and right sort of modules are applied the same logic. And um, later on, I, I implemented encoders to keep track of each module's orientation um, because it's very important that each module's orientation is synced or else um, the robot can't really uh, move in one direction that smoothly. And it was synced with a PID controller. So this is just a snippet of the code itself. Um, and then if I go on, um, I can come back to this when we have questions, but um, this is another code snippet. On um, the next slide, I'll be explaining essentially how the program works a little. So what the program essentially did was that uh, we created module class and we instantiated the module twice. So each module, it would take in a speed and then it would also take in a target, a change value, and differential value. So the differential value is basically causes a turning. So the targeted change in the differential value is just the turning of the module's orientation. And the speed would be based on the left stick on the Y, and then the right stick would be the X. And yeah, that's how it essentially worked. And then for the tank turning, it would be based on this left stick on the X axis. So now I'll move on. Um, I'll actually, I'll do a demo of my chassis. So I think I have to stop screen sharing. I'll go onto my phone. So.
So um, that was just a quick demo of uh, the chassis just moving around. So uh, for the credit, uh, turn off the program. Um, so um, I actually mainly used a, a Reddit thread uh, from Gluten Free about um, a, some of the CAD files for um, the gearbox, the gearbox and some parts of the storage module. And uh, this YouTube video was just explaining exactly how um, Swerve Drive works because, um, yeah, how differential Swerve Drive works. So, yeah, if you guys, I'm open to questions right now before we move on to the next. Actually, we are running a little bit behind schedule, so I think we're going to go ahead and move on to our third presenter, John. If you guys have any questions about Derek's presentation, then feel free to either private message or chat to everybody. Hello, uh, I'm Okay, so my project is Continuous Variable Transmission, or CVT. So I'm John Dunbar, and I'm on the hardware team on 8565. And I'm a, oh, I'm a junior at Plano Senior High School. So the agenda for today uh, is just gonna go through like a very basic design process, like research, design, building, iterations. So first off, what is CVT? So CVT is like a shifting gearbox, basically where you can achieve like high and low gear ratios. And it does that continuously, so it's slightly more efficient than gear, than regular shifting gearboxes. And because it's continuous, it can be controlled with a servo, which is usually too slow for actual shifting gearbox. So this implementation of, implement, implementation of CVT uses uh, V-shaped belts with V-shaped pulleys. So this pulley on the right is special because it's basically split in half. And the two halves are like held together by the spring. But in this picture, when tension is applied to the V-belt by these pinchers, they split apart the two halves of this special pulley, the variable pulley. And when these two halves are split apart, the belt kind of falls inwards to the, towards the center and that makes the pitch diameter of this pulley smaller that changes the gear ratio. So, uh, so as terminology uh, for the rest of this presentation, I'll be referring to this top part as the pinchers, this pulley on the right as a variable pulley and the pulley on the left as a normal pulley. Okay, so in order to build this, I wanna had a goal of like a variance of two. That means if I was like the fastest gear ratio with like three to one, the slowest gear ratio would be six to one. So in order to do that, I had a bunch of calculations. Like, so when the, the pinchers are not engaged, then just a, like a straight pass between the two pulleys, it's pretty simple to calculate the center to center. But when the pulley is engaged, it's like a lot of calculations. So I set up a Excel spreadsheet. So what it does is it takes a bunch of variables. So the pulley one pitch diameter is the normal pulley. Pulley two is the, large pitch diameter of the variable pulley when it's not split apart. The belt length, belt thickness, uh, bearing over outside diameter is this bearing on the pincher. And tolerance is the distance between the belt like here and the belt on the other side. And distance to the intermediary is like this distance right here. So given all of that, uh, it's possible to calculate how much belt this would use thanks to like some uh, this diagram, which I got off Wikipedia, which is pretty informative. And then once you get the belt left, which is how much here, you have to take the inverse of that function, but that's like really hard. So, cause it's such a huge function. So what I did instead is that I had a uh, Excel spreadsheet guess and check for all of these values. And then I use a Excel function called match. And basically given a list match, will find the first value that's above a specified value. And that's really helpful. So some trends about this uh, 
spreadsheet, I guess, or calculations, is that the belt length and the normal pulley pitch diameter, they have a positive correlation with the amount of gear ratio of variance. So you want to you want those to be as big as possible where you're not taking up too much space. And the variable pulley and the, the bearing, they have like a negative correlation with the variance. So if you want the most variable variance, you have to make them really small. And it turns out like getting a variance of like two, like I had my goal as, it's actually kind of hard. So these were really small. So I went on to designing it. First I designed the pinchers, which are very similar to the previous designs, which used like, previous design used like a double jointed arm with one connected to the servo and the servo turned. And the other side was connected to this part. I instead used a gear because I wanted to have more constant force so it's easy to calculate stuff. And also it saves a little bit of space. Another uh, space saving measure I found was that the 632 uh, flathead screws fit very conveniently on the quarter inch bearings. So then I went on and catted everything. Like originally we were planning to integrate this with a swerve drive, but the CVT had like so many iterations, we decided to split them apart. So how this CAD works is that there's an ultra planetary mounted right here. That's a one to one gear ratio in order because torque is what makes the V-belt slip. So we had to transmit all the power as speed. So it transmits the power through a hex shaft here and the hex shaft allows this pulley to transmit rotational power while still being able to go up and down. And then the power goes through this V-belt to here, goes up this hex shaft and goes through some gear ratio reductions into the, the swerve drive. So upon building it, there's like quite a lot of iterations. First one is that you can see this pulley is like diagonal. And that's because like this is very small and we like added too much tolerance to the inside of the hex shaft. So in order to fix that, we made it like almost a press fit and we made this a lot taller and that fixed it. Another problem you might notice that this is already inside and our pinchers are not engaged in this picture, but you can't see it. So this means that it's like being limited in the amount of gear ratio variance because it can't reach the gear ratios where the, the v bell is way out here, which means that the center of the center is too big. And that's because you see this picture, the pitch diameter, which is marked by these tensile members of the v belt, it's not in the center of the v belt. Um, it's different for every v belt. So you just have to like ask your manufacturer and they call this the datum width. It's not like any, the pitch width is a different value for like some older thing. Uh, another problem is that these V-bells are like less flexible, flexible than I thought. So this is like a three quarters of an inch turn right here. And it takes like half a kilogram of force to bend it that much, which is approximately like a bit more than a pound. So because of this, even when running it without like any of the pen, the pinchers engaged. So that should be like the maximum efficiency. We still get like an efficiency of around 75%, which is enough to heat up a one to one motor. So I had to switch it to a three to one motor. And I would say three to one is like on like the, the highest gear ratio you'd probably want to run with CVT because the amount of force the V belt can transfer maximum is like almost the same as like, it's a little bit less than the amount of force the amount of torque, I mean, that a three to one motor can provide. So another problem was that it had a lot of backlash because it was our first time designing with uh, hex shafts. So I've been having errors with that video. So I'll just play it from here. So as you can see this pulley on the bottom left is not moving at all, but these pulleys over here are moving a lot. So it was just a matter of making the, making it like a pretty tight press fit for all the parts that go in a hex shaft. Yeah. And another problem we noticed is that like even the revs metal motor, metal gears had like a little bit of like t a backlash in them. It's another thing that 
the ultra planetaries, if you screw them in too tight, then they get slower. And I didn't want to have to worry about like my screws being too tight and slowing it down versus the screws being too loose and falling out. So I would have found that like putting little washers between the final cartridge and the output stage allows you to screw them in as tight as you want without it slowing down. Now another like general iteration we had is that these uh, standoffs, they actually need to be tolerant to have like extra height so that in the worst case scenario that these timing belt pulleys will have like a little bit of movement up and down. And instead of in this scenario where these standoffs are actually a little bit shorter, like a little bit too short. So then it's a trade off between how shaky do you want it versus how much do you want this top plate to bend. So the final result has efficiencies around 75%, even with uh, the pinchers like add a tiny bit of uh, inefficiency. So here's a video. Oh. Oh, okay. So in this video, I'd like you to pay attention to this collar up in the very top, the very top middle, because that's really the easiest place where you can notice the speed difference. So we had some issues with the gear, which that can be just fixed by just making it a different gear ratio for the servo. So if you guys were going to make this for yourself, uh, I would recommend this different design, which I found out like after I've been, I was making this previous design for quite a while. And essentially, I'll show it. So this design, the tension is applied by like moving this entire motor and pulley assembly back and forth. And that allows a lot more versatility. It's way easier to get like a two times gear ratio variance. And you don't have to make this pulley super small and you don't have to make that pulley, the normal pulley super big or anything. Yeah. So yeah, so credits, um, I have to say a big thanks to FRC team 1640. Because as far as I could see on the internet, like they're the, like, the only team that used CVT. And they're now about to use CVT for the third year in the row. So like recently, a lot of other teams have been, or a couple other teams have been like kind of starting to do CVT too. So there are a couple of places where I found additional information like this thread. And I have to say thanks to Wikipedia because they helped with the calculations. So yeah, that's my presentation. You can just put questions in the chat. Oh, hey, thank you, John. So now we're going to move on to Champers. Champers, I think you're muted. Sorry, my bad. Okay, starting over. Um, so today I'm going to be going over um, alternatives to linear slides, and that's because linear slides are kind of annoying, basically. So a little bit about me. I'm going to be in 11th grade next year, and I've only spent one year in FTC. This past season was my first season in FTC. And outside of robotics, I like to swim, do the circuit design, and sometimes get into 3D graphics. So I'm going to be introducing the overall project with all my, all my ideas, including the ones that were illegal, and then I'll be showing the results for the ones that I actually tested. 
So linear slides, they've been around for a long time and they're pretty much used on every single robot at this point. But the thing with linear slides is you have to string the slides. Um, the strings can get easily tangled and the strings themselves can easily fray and break over time and it's kind of a complex design and there's many reasons not to like it that much, but it's an old reliable method so everyone uses it. So my ideas for other ways to achieve linear motion out of a motor include, this was my first idea, so it was to strap a jet engine or a ducted fan to a linear slide so that we can drive it without any strings at all. Um, this failed without me even ordering any parts because, well, the FTC motors we have around just don't spin fast enough. You need around 20,000 RPM to power a ducted fan, and the fastest ones for FTC go up to 10,000 RPM for without any gear gearboxes on the motor. And that's the Tetrix motor, so that's not even a strong motor. So instead of using a ducted fan, I decided to use drone propellers because you can also achieve lift using drone propellers, and you can spin them at a much lower speed because drone propellers can be a lot bigger. So my second idea was using compliant wheel-driven slides. Um, this is kind of similar to rack and pinion gears, but instead of rack and pinion gears, we have friction against omni wheels. This is a super simple design, and it didn't really take me that long to test. My third idea was using a coil gun. So basically accelerating a magnet through the middle of a coil, which generates an electric or a magnetic field once you pass a current through it. But you guys can probably already tell this is gonna involve a lot of custom electronics, so it's highly illegal. I wasn't able to do this, even if it would have been pretty cool. My fourth idea was using a hydraulic actuator and this probably would have been a really good idea, except for the fact that pressurized fluids are also illegal. Um, hydraulic actuators can be really smooth and they can give you a lot of force without much input power. But Excuse it's illegal, me. so I can do that. Excuse me, we are still seeing slide one. What? You are? Oh. Um, wait. Can, what do you see on my screen right now? Right now we see slide four, but not in the presentation mode, but in the edit mode. I think you were sharing not your presentation window, but a different Google window. Okay, I'll stop sharing and then just share my entire screen. So do you guys want me to go back through all of these slides or do you want me to just keep on going? You can keep on going. We can see good. Thank you. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, my other desktop doesn't really have a webcam, so I have to move over to this laptop and it's running Linux and not really too used to it. So anyways, um, my fifth idea was based off of that hydraulic actuator idea. So instead of using hydraulics, I can just use a belt to power it. And this one isn't illegal, so I was actually able to test it. So here are the results for my completed project. So I got my hands on quite a few different drone propellers, and I strapped them to a Tetrix motor, which spins at 10,000 RPM, and an Andy Mark motor, which spins at 6,000 RPM. So I just basically took off the gearbox and used some this little shaft mount thing right here to directly couple the propeller to the shaft of the motor. So here are the results. Um, the drone propellers are not good for getting out a bunch of force. But the thing with drone propellers is that you can achieve maximum speed of the motor practically just instantly. So the response time of it is really good. You're going to be able to extend your linear slide all the way in a fraction of a second, faster than I can measure. So um, as for the actual force you're getting out of these drone prope propellers, you're going to want to go for the Tetrix motor be simply because there's more RPM on it. Normally, if you were to graph diameter propeller or 
propeller diameter and force out of it, it would be a parabola. As you, it's gonna max out at a certain propeller diameter, and then it's gonna start to drop for a specific motor. But the thing is, with my testing, I was already going up to a 13 inch propeller diameter. That's almost at the 18 inch limit. You can't go much bigger than that. So I wasn't able to see that parabola. As you can see, the force just keeps on increasing. So I think that you probably would have been able to get a little more force out of these propellers, but it's still not enough to do any kind of vertical lifting. So if you were to implement this, you would probably want to do it on a horizontal slide that really doesn't have much weight and needs to extend super fast. I probably could have also gotten more force if I used a gear ratio to step up the RPM and decrease torque because, well, well propellers don't really need a lot of torque. But this was already running behind schedule, so I just moved on to the next project. So this is the compliant wheel-driven slide. Um, it's super easy to implement. You just strap a motor with a compliant wheel right next to a linear slide. And then the wheel, friction between the wheel and the linear slide will just drive it straight out. So one thing to keep in mind here if you were to do this is you have to have two wheels. Because if you were to use only one wheel, this wheel is going to push this linear slide section right here to the right a little bit. And what that ends up doing is it creates a gap right here where the ball bearings go. And what happens is you start losing ball bearings. So you're going to need to have something to counteract the force of the wheel pressing against the slide. Other than that, it's super easy to build. And you get a pretty good amount of force out of it. I was able to get 11 pounds of force out of it with just two, yeah, two core hex motors, which aren't even that strong. And um, you can easily configure it to output more force or less force using the wheel diameter because torque equals force times distance. So force equals torque over distance. So if you were to use a wheel with less diameter, then you're going to get more force. Yeah. And it's also kind of slow. It takes a full two seconds to fully extend, like, I think it was around 10 inches. It's, it's pretty slow. So this would be more useful in situations where you have a heavy load. Now, for the belt-driven actuator, this one's kind of an in-between those two. So how I designed this is I had two timing belts just for more strength. And then um, yeah, I had two timing belts. And then they were held together with this central little hub type of thing that was directly attached to the output shaft. And I also stuck in a switch right here that's shown in red. Or I put red tape on it to make it more visible. That just cuts off power to the motor when it reaches the end point because I didn't have like a rev control hub and I didn't want to mess around with encoders and stuff. So results for this. Um, I didn't really get good results for this because the timing belts started slipping on the pulleys because the thread I chose was a little bit too small. So with a 3.7 to 1 gear ratio orbital motor, from Andy Mark, I was able to get 31 newtons of force, and that's with the timing belt slipping on the pulleys. So I was also able to extend pretty fast, 0.43 seconds using that 3.7 to 1 orbital motor. So that's pretty good. And I also tried using a 40 to 1 gear ratio motor, and that one took 2.9 seconds to fully extend. I wish I could have tested the maximum force out of that one, but the, pulley was, the pulleys were already slipping with the uh, um, 3.7 to 1 gear ratio motor, so I wasn't able to test the maximum force with that one. And if you were to calculate the theoretical maximum force, you would just use the torque equation against force equals torque over distance in a, or radius. In our case, the radius would just be the pulley radius. And I calculated that using our 3.7 to 1 gear ratio motor, we would have been able to get a maximum force of 38 newtons. So 31 newtons is pretty close to that. And considering that 
our timing belts were slipping. That's pretty good. So here's just a quick summary of each of the projects I did. Um, for drone propellers, just remember that they can't output a lot of force, but they'll extend your linear slice extremely quickly. Compliant wheels, they're easy to build, and they have an inherent fail-safe to it. And that, that's because if you were to somehow try to block the, block the slides from fully extending, what's going to happen is the wheels are just going to start sliding. The, wheels, the compliant wheels that drive the slide are just going to start slipping on the slide. So you're not going to ever be able to stall out your motor. So that's kind of like a built-in fail safe. But the thing with that is it's got a limited range because you can't extend this to multiple slides. You can only go extend it to one slide. So you can, it's kind of a limited range and it's pretty slow. For the linear actuator, it goes, it extends at a pretty de decent speed and you can get a pretty good amount of force out of it. But it's also limited in range because you can't extend this to more stages. And it's also somewhat complicated to design. And you're going to need some kind of switch or sensor at the endpoints just to stop, tell the motor when to stop turning. Otherwise, you might start stalling out the motor or you might destroy your 3D printed um, hub thing over there. And that holds the timing belts together. And for the linear slides, um, you guys already know about this one. It's, you can get a decent amount of force out of it. It can be fast if you were to do a cascade. And you can easily do multiple stages. But the thing with it is it's complicated to design. It's heavy and uses a lot of parts. And well, the strings can break pretty easily if you were to somehow stall out the linear slides. So here are some credits. Um, yeah. If you guys have any questions, feel free to ask. Okay, so any questions you guys have for Champers can go in the chat as well. We're going to move on to our final presentation before we take our break, and that is going to be from Sophie, Alyssa, and Shreema of 7172. Campers, you can stop sharing so that Max can come here. Yeah, thank you. Hi, I'm Sophie. Can you all see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, awesome. Um. Uh, Alyssa actually won't be joining us today, um, but we are 7172 Technical Difficulties, um, and this is our appearing cane on the Sky Spin robot. Um, I'm Sophie. I'm Shreema. So during the endgame in last year's challenge Skystone, we noticed the need for a robot to be able to park in the build zone without interfering with other game components and to be time efficient. We were in need of a mechanism that is fast, reliable, efficient, and we were uh, we were in need of a mechanism that is those things. We found the best way to solve the problem was to have a mechanism to extend over the foundation, thereby eliminating the need for the robot to drive around the foundation to park. There were several statistical conditions we had to meet in order to incorporate a mechanism that was fast, reliable, efficient, and safe. One was that the mechanism had to be able to extend at least within five, within two seconds, it has to extend five feet. Had to be compact and fit within eight by four by eight inch area. We also had to eliminate the use of a motor because we had no more motors available to use and also limit ourselves to one servo. Had to be robust and rigid to maximize the success rate and minimize damage. We went through several iterations, such as using a motorized tape or some sort of scissor mechanism, but we found that they don't fit with, well with these criteria as the appearing cane did. Um, so those were our goals, and this is what we actually came up with. 
So as we said, we wanted it to go five feet in two seconds for it to be worth all the work. It ended up actually going 52 inches um, in 0.1 seconds, which is a lot better than our original goal. So it goes 30 miles per hour. Um, it is the fastest linear extension we have seen in FTC. And uh, because we didn't have a motor, because um, we had used all of ours, it runs off of one servo. And as Shruma said, it's a very compact design. Um, this is our robot um, in a practice using the appearing cane. So when we bought it, you'll never guess what it was actually meant to be used as. It was sold as a magic cane. So how it works is you pull this little pin here and it extends. Um, it's basically one large spring. Um, so we modified it so it'd fit on the robot and it'd work with our design. We used Fusion 360 to CAD some pieces and zip ties to hold it all together, of course. Um, so this was our pin release mechanism. Uh, and it moved like this. Um, so when we put it on the robot, we activated it before we, so we took this little zip tie and we put it in this hole and we held it together with the pin mechanism. And so uh, we activated it first and then uh, that way it would be really easy at the end of the match and we wouldn't have any problems. Now, this is a really cool part, but of course there are some risks. Um, it could damage other robots. We had a match where our appearing cane went straight through another uh, robot, went our alliance partner. Um, they were fine, but um, it could knock over our skyscraper, which is something our partners had to be super careful about. Um, it also could really easily go out of the field in that little corner um, on the walls. Um, also something our drivers had to be super careful about was that if it touched stones on the skyscraper or any stones on the foundation, they didn't count. Um, and if it released early, um, it would be super hard for us to get under the bridge and everything in the game would make our life really hard because it would be huge and our extension would be huge. So what we did to prevent releasing early is we actually uh, programmed in a sequence um, of we hit three buttons um, at the same time so that to release it. So we couldn't accidentally hit a button and oh no, we can't do anything for the rest of the game. Um, another thing that we figured out was it was actually kind of really hard to get off of the field because we had to recoil it back up and hold it with one hand while picking up the robot to get it off of the field. Um, and then this is a video of it at the regional championship. Um, here we're just pulling up the foundation and then in a second we will use our appearing cane. Uh, that is our presentation. Does anyone have any questions for us? Okay, if there's no more questions for 7172, then we're going to go ahead and take our about five minutes break. So make sure to be back here at 3 p.m. 